Welcome back to Bonn and the Global Landscapes Forum Digital Edition to all our audiences around the world. Activism can activate, research can generate, practice can instigate, together we can co-create a vision for climate smart landscapes. Those were the words from the youth in our last session and we hope to continue this thinking in our penultimate discussion forum in Act 3 of the Digital Edition. For those of you watching Act 1 yesterday, you will remember our host Terry Sunderland who provided us with such insightful answers in the Rights Q&A. We are looking forward to hearing more from Terry and the other speakers on the theme of operationalizing the landscape approach and hearing stories from action on the ground. Don't forget to submit your questions and thoughts via social media with the hashtags ThinkLandscape and GLF Kyoto 2019 and submit your questions via the chat box next to your live stream. We wish you a very constructive discussion and thank you very much. Um, good morning, Vancouver. Good afternoon, Bonn, and good evening, Kyoto. Uh, welcome to the Global Landscapes Forum um, held here at University of British Columbia um, in Vancouver. It feels like the end of the earth given all the time differences. Um, related to where the, the, the event is being streamed. Um, today's session, uh, we have the next two hours to talk about operationalizing the landscape approach, learning from doing. We have a fabulous panel on hand, a live audience, uh, hopefully will, will grow as the, uh, the session develops, and an online audience as well. So what we'll do, the format will be, um, the panelists will introduce themselves very briefly, We'll have a, a short video of introduction talking about the landscape approach. It was a video that was prepared for the original and the first Global Landscapes Forum in Warsaw in 2013. And it really outlines some of the issues that we're going to be discussing here today. Um, and then we'll, each uh, panelist will make an intervention based on his or her uh, particular experience related to landscapes and sustainable landscape management. So without f further ado, may I ask uh, our panelists to go ahead and, and introduce themselves very briefly. Charles. Yes. My name is Charles Menzies, uh, Kakatla Nation, uh, which is an indigenous community on the north coast of British Columbia in Canada. I'm also a faculty member here at the University of British Columbia. Good morning. My name is Samuel Adeyanju. I'm very delighted to be on this respective panel. I'm a grad student at UBC Faculty of Forestry and also the president of IFSA UBC, the International Forestry Student Association at UBC. Uh, my research focuses more on um, cultural landscapes and biodiversity as well as um, community certified forest lands in South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Hello, my name is Naveen Ramankudi. I'm a professor here at uh, the University of British Columbia as well. Um, and my work is on mostly on global scales, looking at the trade-offs between agriculture and the environment. Good morning, everyone. I'm Intu Budiartono. I'm originally from Indonesia. I work um, mostly in the tropics. Um, I'm an, a visual anthropologist and I work a lot with communities who are very dependent on uh, their nature and I work a lot with hunter-gatherers group and um, communities that are on small islands in Indonesia um, and the forest dependent co communities in um, Congo Basin. Thank you. Um, we did have a fifth panelist but unfortunately she had a uh, family emergency so Gabrielle Kissinger couldn't be with us today. Um, so let's proceed with the video James if you don't mind. Taman Nasional Gunung Halimun Salak terdiri dari dua ekosistem, yaitu ekosistem Halimun dan ekosistem Salak. pH-nya itu antara 4 sampai 6, itu cocok sekali untuk teh. Di sini tanahnya emang bagus untuk dipakai tanaman gitu, air juga bagus. One of the most strategic factory of Nakua is in Gunung Salak. Kami tinggal dan hidup di atas pegunungan. Di, atas, di tengah hutan, kami menyebutnya begitu. Dan masih menjalankan tatanan tradisi yang memang menjadi titipan dari leluhur. Landscapes mean many things to many people. In the past, these different aspects of a landscape have been managed in isolation. But a shift is happening. 
conservation organisations, development groups, companies and governments working in the same area are starting to reach out to each other to tackle problems together. And as the global population grows and we need to produce more, more sustainably on less land, this new approach offers a way forward. So a landscape approach is essentially managing complex landscapes in an integrated fashion, in a holistic fashion, incorporating all of the different land uses within those landscapes into a single management process. We need a landscape approach because there are many different uses of, of our land and our natural resources and we need to balance these. We need to balance across forestry, across agriculture, water resource management, biodiversity, conservation and the needs of people. So this is uh, Gunnan Halliwood Salek National Park. Considering we're close to one of the mega cities of the world, Jakarta, it's an amazing repository of, of the last areas of biodiversity of the area. But more crucially, this landscape provides a very important catchment for watersheds and provides most of the water for the entire Jakarta Basin. Javan leopards and gibbons still thrive here, but the park is no remote wilderness. It's located in Indonesia's most populous province and is surrounded by agriculture, plantations, cities and industry. Sebenarnya ada salah satu persepsi bahwa reservasi itu adalah hanya untuk menjaga hutan, satwa seperti itu. Kami katakan sangat tidak mungkin. Artinya kalau hanya berpikir ke arah situ dan sudah otomatis kita harus mengakomodir yang namanya kebutuhan hidup. Okay, be careful. One of the national park's strategies for doing this is to encourage tourism in the park. Keberlangsungan keutuhan hutan ini bagi bisnis ya istilahnya saya dan keluarga saya yang ada di sini ya sangat penting sekali dengan adanya. Tapi kalau tanpa adanya hutan ini kemungkinan juga turis itu nggak bakalan banyak yang datang ke sini gitu. The homestays provide income for a few. But most of the communities living in or near the park make their living from agriculture, farming or working on the area's famous tea plantations. Just over the ridge, the Kasepohan traditional community practice rice agriculture. Sebagai keseharian, sebagai titipan, sebagai adat yang harus dilakukan oleh masyarakat adat Banten Kidul. Menanam padi satu tahun satu kali. They also use forest products for weaving, food and fuel wood. This landscape attracts industries too. The mountains of Halimun and Salak generate generous quantities of a valuable resource, water. Global company Danone Aqua bottles 5 billion litres of water each year in Indonesia. 15% of that comes from the slopes of Mount Salak. Uh, to today the quality of the water is very very good so this is uh, uh, really protected by the mountain and the forest and the Gunung Salak. Aqua is one of many companies and organizations engaging with the national park in various conservation and development initiatives starting the kinds of conversations that are essential for an integrated landscape approach. Of course it doesn't always go smoothly. Kalau saya melihat bahwa keberadaan Taman Nasional bisa dikatakan bagus karena sama-sama menjaga hutan. Juga tidak bisa dikatakan bagus kalau terlalu menekan kebutuhan masyarakat. Misalnya dengan tidak membolehkan masyarakat menebang untuk kebutuhannya sendiri. Nah, tantangannya tetap pasti ada karena sampai uh, pada saat mengawali kita bagaimana untuk berkolaboratif, artinya uh, perbedaan pendapat itu muncul. Today, all of the stakeholders that are playing in the same system do not have the same objective. You know, for example, like uh, us, we want to protect the forest, but maybe some of the industry do not think about that, so we are not going in the same direction. So in fact, uh, win-win solutions in most tropical landscapes have proved to be somewhat elusive. And the real tenet, if you like, of, of integrated management of, of landscapes and the landscape approach is recognizing for trade-offs and negotiating for trade-offs so that all the stakeholders come to a, an agreement at which there are winners and losers, but the, the, you win more and, and lose less, if, if you like. And, and that's really the, the fundamental behind the landscape approach. Organizations and donors need to be flexible too, as landscapes are constantly changing, while new pressures arise. Itu yang selalu kita khawatir dengan adanya pembalakan liar. Kalau di keseluruhan Halimun gitu, 
kebanyakan yang kemungkinan sangat cepat mengganggu atau menyebabkan kerusakan itu adalah salah satunya peti penambang mas tanpa izin itu. The biggest threat is changing the the forest into the um, residential land. Things change daily, things change weekly, things change monthly, but you need to adapt to those changes. And often projects are constrained by their project document which says this is what we're going to do in a landscape and that's sort of followed um, almost to rote. But you can't manage a, a complex landscape like that. You need to have that adaptability and the flexibility to change. It's not easy, but despite the huge range of competing interests, everyone has a stake in ensuring landscapes continue to provide environmental services into the future. Kalau kita kehilangan Gunung Salak, berarti uh, kita akan kehilangan yang sangat besar bagi perusahaan ini. Yang harus dijaga yang pertama hutan. Karena hutan selain untuk melindungi kita semua juga untuk mendatangkan air. Karena kalau Taman Nasional misalkan sampai berubah, otomatis kesuburan perkebunan akan berkurang juga. Elemen yang penting adalah bumi. Gunung Halliman is a very extreme example if you like of where we should be applying a landscape approach. It's uh, in an area of extremely high population pressure, um, lots of other pressures on the land, um, but it's an incredibly complex lands landscape because of it. And something that seems to be working. We have a, you know, 40,000 hectares of pretty much intact rainforest up, up there. And if there's anywhere where, where a landscape approach could be tried and tested, it's, it's here. And this is where all of the different interests and stakeholders have to be talking to each other. And this shouldn't just happen uh, on Gunung Halloween. This is an example of what should be happening in all the landscapes that we're interested in. In terms of the meeting here in Warsaw at the COP, uh, landscape approaches is so important because the way we manage landscapes affects both climate mitigation and climate adaptation. The scope of the challenge that we face is enormous. It's global and it's unprecedented. What we need to do is to come together to take the many success stories that we have from all over the world, bring them together, learn from them collectively and apply them at a global scale. Some of your experiences, I mean, you've been very much involved in on-the-ground practi practice looking at landscape scale management in Indonesia and also Central Africa, um, particularly from a social and participatory um, mapping perspective. Share some of uh, your experiences and, and, and tell us what, what's worked and what hasn't worked in, in your experience. Yeah, thanks, Terry. So uh, that was one of the examples from Java, right? And um, Indonesia consists of really diverse ethnic group and it's island, so you can imagine how different from one island to the other. And we are sort of one of the country that has the most um, biodiversity on Earth, you could say. And very interesting if you're interested in um, um, studying biodiversity of wildlife or plants. So um, I work a lot with different hunter-gatherer communities in uh, Borneo or in Sumatra and in Papua, for example. Um, they're still very dependent on their forests, but they also need um, better livelihoods. So again, uh, we were talking a lot about trade-offs yeah, and uh, conservation and development. So it is a very complex landscape, and the, the landscape is very dynamic. And um, I think uh, I had to really understand the conditions of the local livelihoods and all those things. And so we have to spend quite a long time, basically, to understand really the system, the culture, the environment and all the different needs of the different um, stakeholders who are uh, living in the area, but also the ones who are coming to the area. And as we know, um, everywhere, I think, around the globe, um, people um, developing really fast. So um, we have tried to use a lot of different methods, and some works better than others, of course. Uh, it depends also um, on the diversity of um, education, ethnic groups, and different languages that with whom we work. So I, I think as an, a visual anthropologist, it was very useful for us to use um, visual images, we could say. We use a lot of drawings, we use a lot of videos, uh, painting, um, and we also 
try not only to work on a um, smaller scale at a village level, but we try to understand also the different scale. For example, working with um, district level government, um, national level government, and then we also go to international conferences uh, in order to be able to uh, exchange experience and ideas. And I work also in the Congo Basin with some of the Baka and uh, Baka groups, uh, the hunter-gatherers group in Cameroon, Central African Republic. So it is quite an interesting way of uh, learning from each other, um, sort of um, trying to understand what are the differences and what are the needs and wants of these different people who are living in that landscape. So. What would you say about time scale? I mean, we, we alluded to the issue of the project cycle in the, in the video. Yeah, do I think... You, do you see the, long, the landscape approach or, or implementing those, yeah. these type of long-term um, kind of programs a much more process-oriented rather than project-oriented approach? Yeah, I think that's one of the difficulties that we face if you have uh, donors coming. Usually they only have three years to five years program or project, but uh, we're trying to have more long-term collaboration with our local partners. I say partners because we work a lot with local NGOs, local government, but also especially with the communities and trying to understand what are the outcomes that they would like to reach because uh, um, some of these, um, most of these hunter-gatherers group that I used to go since 20 years ago, now they're already sedentary and they all want jobs and they want to be able to have access to healthcare, schools, and all the things. So, so long-term uh, long collaboration, I think it's a, a really good way of um, working with all these different stakeholders. And I guess uh, now being based in university, um, I always bring my students, masters and PhD students, and they come along with me and they have to live with the communities in those areas. Sometimes there's no electricity, and. Sometimes you do have to walk a few kilometers away to get water. So uh, understanding the different complexities in that landscape, I think that would be able to help us to understand better the condition there. Um, yeah. OK, thank you. I'm going to turn to Naveen now. Um, and Naveen works on um, global issues of agriculture uh, and uh, food security. Um, and of course, one of the biggest drivers of deforestation and environmental change is, is agricultural expansion. So Naveen, how do we manage our current agriculture and the need to feed whatever it is, 9 billion people by 2050 uh, with the need to have sustainable landscapes, provision of ecosystem services? Um, and that trade-off and, and synergy, you know, there are, there are obvious um, conflicts but also complementarities between uh, global agriculture and sustainable landscapes. But where do you see us in 20, 50 years with the current food system that's in place? Yeah, thanks, Terry. Um, first of all, let me say that I am increasingly convinced that uh, we need to have a landscape approach uh, because I, that's the scale at, uh, or the level at which decision making happens um, and that we can't design global solutions uh, for the challenges we face. Um, at the same time, uh, we have to recognize that um, different landscapes have different biocapacities, different landscapes have different um, um, abilities to meet the needs of the people, and so what is the, uh, so we also have to think on a global scale. So some by, some landscapes probably have more than what the, peop the, the people within it need, and other landscapes don't. Um, and so how are we going to use a landscape approach at a global scale uh, when agriculture and 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 uh, its needs are one of the biggest threats on um, conservation today? Um, another way to think about it is that all landscapes have um, stakeholders, and we typically think of stakeholders as, as at the local level, but every landscape today also has a global stakeholder. Um, so how do we bring the voices of those, or the values and needs of those global stakeholders into, into decision making? Um, and also, uh, in, conversely, are the global stakeholders willing to pay uh, for, to, um, to achieve sustainable landscapes. So broadly speaking, I think about sustainable landscapes um, as only being sustainable if they can work at the global scale. Let me just um, lead you in another slightly more controversial direction. Um, there's a whole movement now looking at half Earth, for, you know, conserving half of the Earth's terrestrial surface for conservation. Obviously, that has a huge impact on future agriculture, urbanization, and other human land use. I know that you and your, your team have been working on this. 
um, and particularly in the, in the context of smallholder farmers and the, obviously the, the large proportion of food that they produce globally. How do you see that, that dichotomy, the, the, the sort of half earth versus, you know, uh, it's rather a dystopian vision of the world, isn't it, in many respects, a June like uh, version of, you know, we, we basically annex 50% of the, the, the earth and the other 50% gets used for human use. But how do you see that playing out? I mean, it, it's a, again a controversial concept and it's something you've addressed and I'd be interested, interested to hear your, your views on that. Yeah, I'm really on the fence on this issue. Um, <laughs> Um, I was at a conference uh, about 10 days ago where we had a session on Half Earth, um, one of the most, uh, uh, most well-attended sessions of the entire conference. Um, and we had a, a debate on whether people support Half Earth or not. And it was really interesting to hear the conversations around that. People would say they were the panelists, the people who were leading the panel forced all the panelists to either say yes or no, whether they support Half Earth. Yeah. Um, and uh, people were really challenged. Someone, some would say yes, but, or no, but. It was, there was a lot of buts. Um, anyway, to, to, to bring it back to the context, if people don't actually understand what half Earth means, there's been a proposal that we set aside half of, uh, of the Earth's uh, terrestrial land surface and also o ocean surfaces uh, for nature and devote uh, the rest of the land for human uses. Um, E.O. Wilson first proposed this uh, in one of his books. So um, um, my group and I have also looked at this idea and looked at the trade-offs. Um, from a purely aspirational point of view, um, it, it, it's really, it, it, it really is appealing, um, and it's a global kind of call to order. Um, humans occupy about uh, half to 3% of the global land surface today. Um, at best 3%, but through our footprint, we occupy about a third of our world's land surface, about 33% through our agriculture and grazing activities. So we have a large footprint on this planet, um, and we are just one species. Um, so from a kind of moral perspective, um, the idea that we should at least set aside half of our world's lands for other species um, is very appealing. Um, it, you know, I wish we could do it. Um, but when we look at the half-earth proposal, there is a lot of uh, concern that um, it's another green grab for nature, is one of the terms people have used, that it will be another kind of land grab where you know, you know, conservation um, goals are, are dominate the conversation over livelihood goals of people who live on those landscapes. Um, so we did some research where we looked at those trade-offs, and depending on how it's done, uh, we we estimated that as much as 30% of global calories could be lost um, if we implemented a half-earth proposal. Um, and most of these lost calories will be in places where people most need it. Um, so how can we manage these trade-offs? And again, I think uh, a landscape approach um, has potential for addressing questions like that because uh, that's, a, that's a scale at which you can bring the different stakeholders together to have a conversation. Um, the other... Um, element of half earth is this dichotomy between save, setting aside half the land for nature and the other half for humans, wherein we could be thinking about working landscapes. Uh, Claire Kremen, um, a, a professor at Berkeley who's coming soon to UBC, she's uh, you know, advocated for the idea that we should not just think about biodiversity <coughs> being in these protected areas, we should think about increasing biodiversity in our working landscapes, mm. in the places where we live, in the places where we uh, do our agriculture. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to that in the, uh, the Q&A session. So let me pass uh, over to Sam, who's actually wearing two hats today. Uh, one as a researcher. Um, he's just completed his fieldwork in Nigeria, which he's going to talk about, but also as a youth leader. Um, I was involved in a Q&A yesterday with Sabrina Abraham, who's the, the Global Landscapes Forum Youth Coordinator. And she's of a firm belief that the youth are going to save the world from the rest of us. Um, and maybe she's right. So Sam, give us your perspective, both on the, the, the youth um, perspectives on, on sustainable landscapes, but also touch a little bit on your unique research in Nigeria on sacred forests. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I just got back from Nigeria about uh, one month ago, uh, working on my graduate research, which looks at um, cultural landscapes in uh, southwest Nigeria. Uh, it's part of this uh, multi three year, multi year project in, uh, funded by the Onboard Foundation in Nigeria, looking at investigating 
um, the drivers of conservation in sacred groves in southwest Nigeria. Uh, so for people who do not probably understand the, the concept of sacred groves, so sacred groves or sacred forests, as the case may be, are uh, landscapes that are of cultural or spiritual importance to local people. So these most times are not necessarily only forests or trees. In some places it could be water, river, it could be sculptures and a lot of other features in those um, landscapes. Uh, my project in Nigeria was looking at three different sites in two states in southwest Nigeria, Undo and Ocean State. And these three sites had um, unique um, characteristics in the sense that one of these sites, um, Ocean Shogu Sacred Group in Ocean State, Nigeria, uh, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site design designated in 2005. And my two other sites in Undo State, one is um, a national, Nigerian National Monument, Idori Hills. And the third one is kind of more kind of local state um, cultural heritage site. So I was looking at what are the drivers of um, the social cultural or the social economic drivers of conservation within these um, three landscapes. And for my I will, for this talk, I just want to focus more on um, Oshun Oshugu Circle Group because of its uh, international re relevance as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, so Oshun Oshugu Circle Group um, as a lot of features in terms of forests and river because um, the, the landscape uh, revolves around this river which is termed to be a goddess, Oshun goddess worshipped by um, people in that part of Nigeria. And uh, so the, the landscape itself covers a natural vegetation of about 75 hectares. Most sacred groups are usually very small in places like India who has like lots of 100,000 sacred groups in India, also in Ghana a lot of um, thousands of secret groups exist in those places, and usually they could be between one hectare, in some places, uh, thousands of hectares. So in my site in Nigeria, uh, they range between 75 hectares, as well as having another 45 buffer hectares buffer. Uh, so in this site, um, one of the questions that will be asked is, these landscapes are also kind of agrarian communities. So people who live around these landscapes are mostly farmers, cocoa farmers, oil palm farmers, um, cassava as well as banana. So how come we are able to protect or conserve these landscapes uh, within this agrarian community? Uh, research has shown that, for instance, in Ocean Shogur Sacred Grove, they have um, uh, over 400 um, flora species that are endemic to that uh, particular landscapes, and over 200 of those are tagged to be of high medicinal value to people. Um, also, in, in, the, in that particular site, there is um, some endangered and threatened species that are protected, especially monkey species. Um, white threatened monkey species are found on this site, as well as um, the red mangabe are found on this site. So, um, how come these um, species have been, able to pro have been protected over the years? I would say they are majorly due to four reasons. Uh, one is because of the traditional um, ecological knowledge that the local people who live around or within these landscapes have used to manage the site over the years. So sacred forests are very important to the people. They go there for worship, they go there to get medicinal herbs, for healing from sickness, and a lot of other um, ecosystem services that they derive from there. So people are not allowed to cut trees, they are not allowed to kill animals, they are not allowed to dump refuse, and to also there are a lot of prohibitions that exist in that uh, particular landscapes based on the traditional knowledge and the myths and the taboos that are used to manage the landscape. Also, I think the multi-level governance system that has been uh, practiced on the, on the landscape is also very important. So being a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it has some kind of international um, influence and cooperation that exists in that landscape, as well as um, the, the national government under the National Commission for Museum and Monuments have the offices in, within the grove that kind of monitors how tourists come in and out, those who come for prayers, how is the place managed. And so they have um, forest guards who monitor that the monkey species are not killed and other wildlife species within um, the landscape. Uh, third will also be the ecotourism aspects um, uh, that is currently being practiced on the landscape. So annually they have the Oshun Oshubu Festival that brings people from within and outside Nigeria into international people come to visit the sites for prayers, um, to also see the, the sculptures and other things that exist on the land. So that in some ways also provide um, livelihoods for the local economy and also the national economy 
as the case may be, because when people come, they have to feed, they have to lodge, they have to transport. And uh, based on my research, a lot of people say when this, um, during this major festival, <coughs> almost everyone in the community knows that something is going on and there's a lot of people selling food, um, transport and other stuff like that. So that also contributes uh, to the local economy and in a way that has been driving uh, conservation in that uh, particular landscape. Uh, so if I would talk about youth's um, involvement um, operationali operationalizing the landscape approach, um, as a representative of IFSA, the International Forest Forestry Student Association, um, so at the GLF and in most international um, policy platforms, they have this kind of youth consistency or youth um, group move movement within most um, um, international platform, like in the UNFCCC, they have the youth consistency, at the UNCBD, they have the youth consistency. So at GLF also, I would say the Youth in Landscapes Initiative could also be tagged as um, the youth constituency of the GLF. So these are a group of people, um, IFSA members played very uh, important roles in bringing about the Youth in Landscapes at the second GLF in Lima period in 2014. And over the years, this um, initiative has grown to accommodate or represent over 50,000 young people, young professionals or students working in agriculture, in forestry, in ecology. And the, the initiative helps to kind of bridge the gap uh, and they use kind of some three models which looks at um, before, during and after the GLF. So before the GLF, they have this pre-GLF workshop and they bring youth from all over the world, diverse uh, backgrounds to talk together, to meet each other, to run a lot of workshops, um, Dragon Den, um, pitch ideas, network, build skills. And even during the GLF, they also play key roles in like, leading plenary sessions, giving youth keynote speech, and a lot of other things. And they also have mentorship program, both in conference mentorship and after the conference mentorship. So they pair um, scientists, professionals with young people who have kind of similar interests to kind of within the one, two days of the GLF to network together, attend the same workshop or conference um, section together to kind of build capacity for these young people. Uh, so that is some of the things the Youth in Landscape Initiative have been doing um, over the years. And one other major uh, important thing is um, the landscape heroes that was, that was insisted last year at GLF 2018, where young people are allowed to nominate themselves or nominate other people to say, I want to nominate this person who is working in Nigeria doing restoration work. And the GLF received about 38 um, entries from 38 countries across his continent to, to show that young people are really doing amazing stuff um, in different places of the world. So I think I will. Okay, thank you. You, yeah. you avoided the question on whether youth were going to save the world, but I'll come back to you on that yeah, yeah. Um, towards the, <coughs> later on in the session. Charles, um, a big thing of the GLF this mm. year is indigenous people's rights mm. and access. Um, and there's been a lot, there was a lot of discussion yesterday online um, about the annexation of land, particularly for protected areas, um, which obviously um, creates huge issues of access for indigenous peoples um, and issues of tenure resource use, um, globally they're huge issues, mm. but they're also big issues here in British Columbia, in Canada, um, where obviously you've done most of your research. Can you share some of your perspectives uh, mm -hmm. on those issues? <coughs> yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity, and uh, uh, it's always a pleasure to be able to speak here in the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation. <coughs> to, and I look forward to the day when the university backs up its acknowledgement by actually paying rent, land rent. Uh, for the privilege of actually being established here. Um, one of the things that always strikes me with ideas like, for example, the half-earth principle or pro program, <clears throat> is I think it represents the ways in which humanity has alienated itself from its surroundings and its and a land and water-based practices. So to a certain extent, those ideas are only required when a society moves, is, separates itself through technology, practices, and engagements that make the land, makes the water strange, that makes it unfamiliar. So the people, for example, here in Vancouver, put on a backpack, or they probably don't even put on a backpack. They might not even put on boots or runners and just trundle up into our mountains here, and then all winter long, all summer long, we hear news accounts of people getting lost in the woods because they're so alienated they think they can take a cell phone, take one of these delightful little devices, 
And no matter where I am, I can check. But that's not the way in which our knowledge of the land works. And in Lake Hugh, Kikatla, which is on the north coast of the, this province on the coast, uh, Lake Hugh means the place the people are from. It's the land, our territory, it includes the water, though there is a technical word within the language to talk about the owned water, our, our waterways and oceans. This is an area that is a, what geoclimate type folks might call a temperate rainforest. Uh, it rains an awful lot. Where I grew up in, on the north coast, over 100 inches a year of rain. And that's a lot of rain. I mean, people in Vancouver complain about rain. You only get 60 inches a year. That's nothing. 60 is it's hardly anything to, to look at. There's streams, creeks, mountains. In the area I'm from, we have a coastal alpine that's about 1,100 to 1,500 meters above sea level. We have tree level ends at around 850 meters. And then you have this kind of band on the side. The band that goes from the sea level to about 500 meters has been destroyed by industrial logging. And by destroyed, what I mean is they've removed a multi-crop, multi-plant, multi-entity space that our peoples tended and managed. And that's another point to keep in mind. There is indigenous practice engagement in that space. has been replaced by a monocrop. I remember one time talking to a forest technician who was surveying a, a cut block in Kakatla territory, and he was talking about all the plants they're putting back and describing the multiple variation of plants. And I said, so where is the yew trees, which is a very important wood. It's a medicine. It's an important strength uh, of word to use. Well, yew trees, he says. <laughs> I mean, he said they're essentially important. It's not fair to put this poor young man as a representative of all forestry technicians. It's a kind of unfair thing to do. But he basically said there's no economic value. And I said, what about the crab apples? And he looked at me kind of quizzically and go, crab apples? There's no apples here. Well, technically speaking, he's right. That's not an apple tree. But we call them in English crab apples. Uh, and it's an amazing thing that's been cultivated. Hazelnuts. The berry crops are managed and cultivated. So, when you think about ideas like half-earth half notions, it implies that human beings are not engaged in the world where our indigenous communities and practices have been fully and actively engaged. There is no part of British Columbia that for the last 10 millennia has not seen the impact of human intervention. We have shaped the world that European colonists moved into in the late 1700s and the early 1800s in this place. Our indigenous ancestors created the old growth in terms of the spaces. The parklands that, that, that people to the Slocan Valley thought were open and just perfect for agriculture, that was created through burning. The camas metals that people saw in Victoria and those are that was human practices. The chocolate lily, or we sometimes hear them called as Indian rice, that you see in estuarine areas, that wasn't an accident. That just didn't happen naturally. In fact, I would argue the entire coast is a disturbed environment that's been disturbed for millennia. And part of the practice of thinking about this is understanding the complete intrinsic relationship between people and the land. So in our community, we have what are called WELP, or house groups, which are organized through kinship relations, and there are actual territories attached to these. And most of the territories are based upon coastal watersheds. And these watersheds go from the sea level to the mountain peaks, and they cross islands because we're coastal people, so there's a lot of islands. And the human beings who lived there in past, what you call the old people, the clay again, who were there from the beginning of time through these spaces, were intimately engaged in related. So we talk about the social relations between people and animals, but people and people, different types of social people. Understanding the world is, is existing in that sense. The notion of the, senti the fixed landscapes as being sentient beings as well, so also part of thinking of that. That is an intrinsic relationship which it, you then put a block on it and you put a boundary and call it a protected or conserved area. You're actually committing a violence not just to the land or the people, to, uh, pardon me, not just to the land, but to the people. You actually make it impossible for an indigenous community to survive. And what the colonial regimes globally have always done is survey, segment, alienate, and pre reserve for a whole range of different purposes. And I actually would argue for a kind of radical return to traditional practices. And if that means there's too many people, maybe there are. But some of the projections I've been reading is suggesting the world population is actually starting to crest in the next 50 to, to 75 years and start to move slowly down again. <clears throat> 
So some of the excitement that drives this need to constantly revolutionize uh, instruments of production is all based upon an acquisitive, greed-oriented practice. And if you look back in our community, there, there's a line that people say, we focus on need. We never harvest more than we need. No. Need is a socially defined category. It's not something that's you know, abstract or, or absolute. But the way in which need is defined is premised upon the relations we have with other social beings. And when you sever and undermine the social beings, so you put a whole kind of computer modeling system over top of the landscape where you've never even been there. <laughs> but you can tell me how best to operate our fish creek. That's a problem. Uh, and I just want to say, I'm not, I, didn't, I meant to glance, okay, I want to say one thing, just to talk about the, the stream, what it's like to stand up at the low tide, okay? Imagine yourself on a little rocky island and you've got a kind of cobblestone beach sloping into a creek that's coming out. The creek might only be about 20 feet wide at the mouth of this creek and maybe if you've just been running by in a pleasure craft you haven't actually seen the creek, but you, we've come together, we've got off on the boat, we put our skiff out, we anchored it up, we stand on the beach, and we're looking up toward the creek, and we see these lines of rock that maybe at first you just think are some sort of accident of fate, the water currents have washed down here, but those have been put there. Some archaeologists have worked on these, have found these, these stone structures could be as old as six, seven, eight thousand years old. Depends upon a whole bunch of things, the way the sea level moves and this kind of stuff. So you walk through that creek, you see a big rock line, then you see a V, you come up a little bit, you move up to the high tide top of the high tide, and then you keep walking through that creek. Now this creek in our part of the world might only be 10 miles long before you get to a, to a lake that's about two, uh, two, two, a mile or two itself long. This is a sockeye creek we're talking about, sockeye salmon that require lake-based systems. But as you're walking those 10 miles to the creek, you'll see logs laying down across the creek. They haven't fallen. They've been actually put there. <clears throat> you see brush has been cleared. This entire space is, is manicured. And then at some point, someone says, <clears throat> notice those huckleberries there. That's a berry crop that's been managed. Or you notice down closer to the waterfront something called wako, which is actually currant, uh, which is a delicious fruit. I don't know if anyone's ever had wild currant. Sometimes we call them stink currant in the English common language because they have a really musty smell. Excellent. Or it's salau all the way along. Often in English called laughing berries is another word, or zawes is the Somalic word. An amazing berry that's been in the news recently because people are noticing they've been damaged by the changes in climatic conditions. But as you walk up and you come closer and closer, you might actually find at the mouth of the lake uh, the remains of wooden stakes put in the ground. And then, this is a bet I like to play with people, because I may say, put me down anywhere in the coast, blindfold me, spin me around, but point me uphill. And I am willing to bet that even with a blindfold on, I can, if I don't fall down and bang my head before I get there, find at least a half dozen culturally modified trees. And what are they? Bark strip trees. And you start doing these surveys. It got so bad in the forest sector when they first started saying, oh, we're going to preserve and put a buffer, five meter buffer, 10 meter buffer, whatever, around these trees. They realize, oh my god, there's too many of them to preserve. If we preserved every single one, we wouldn't be logging. That's human interaction in the environment, shaping, cultivating, managing in a particular sustainable way for millennia on this coast. And that's kind of the, the, the lesson and the knowledge that indigenous communities bring to this idea. It's a sense of how to realize we're not nature and culture. We are an integrated living system and basically we move on a kind of scale. And, you know, I've never myself used the word landscape scale, but it's a parallel to our house territory like you. Per how the Welp Lagoop <coughs> is linked to these kind of watersheds. So I stand at the uh, shoreline, I see up to the top mountain, and of course, we actually go to the other side of the mountain too because we, we like to hunt mountain goat, at least in the past. Uh, and that is a story for another day. But it's that connection of the social connections between people, which is why the ideas of marine protected areas, preserve, special pr preservation areas, and these kind of targets, because the impl implication is the rest of it can completely be eradicated or changed or mowed under or, trans, or, tra or plowed under. And that's what's something we need to move away from if we really want to have a serious possibility of there being a place for our grandchildren's grandchildren to live. We're going to actually really fundamentally have to change. Thank you. No, that's a fabulous intervention. And it leads me on to a, a, maybe a, a point that maybe both you and Intu can address. 
One of the critiques of the, the Global Landscapes Forum uh, over the last uh, six or seven years is that it's a very artificial construct, the, the sustainable landscape in terms of land use planning and a top-down approach rather than understanding the grassroots kind of approach that you're talking about. I mean, we have two billion people living in rural landscapes. They don't think about the segregated function. They think about the systems in which they live and work. And the Global Landscapes Forum um, main objective is to reach a billion people, which is a fairly ambitious target, um, through landscape management. But again, it comes from a very top-down perspective. How do we capture this grass, grassroots kind of approach that you've described and I know Intu has worked on um, to actually feed into those policy processes and actually get a better perspective of the multi-strata type uh, management systems that are actually already happening and they're not imposed? You want to go first or do you want me? Yeah, I, I can say something but because I think we need to understand that um, a community nowadays is becoming very heterogeneous. Uh, before, in a village, everybody sort of is more homogeneous, but with the changing world and access to internet and so on and so forth, people become so aware of a lot of different things. And also, um, for example, when I work with uh, the Badui community in Java or the Baka Bigmis in Cameroon or the Punan groups in Borneo, uh, even the elders were saying to me, Into, we need to be careful because our youth uh, generation, the younger generation, they have different wants. And, uh, and of course, if we can keep our forest, we would like to. Why would you want to conserve our forest and our biodiversity, they said. And uh, if we can, we would want to have those things, but we also want to have jobs. We also want to have infrastructure. We want to have access to education. We can sell our crops to the market and things like that. So, but we do, that's why I think we need to understand that there are all these complexities at different levels. Um, and people are so different uh, in, in, the, in, in one village, and it's not the same anymore like before. Like Indonesia before, in, when we became a republic in 1945, we were only like well, 50 million people, and now we are 250 million. <laughs> so, and becoming more and more different um, uh, uh, in different places and different islands. And, and I guess we, we need to understand as well that, um, well, coming from um, sort of several years working in conservation organization, I was actually engaged by IUCN to be community engagement officer because I'm sort of partly part of a community uh, in Indonesia, you could say indigenous groups and, and um, an anthropologist, and I'm interested in arts and culture. So, so one of the ways to link all these different complexities is using this visual uh, part of things because a lot of the communities with whom I work have oral traditions, they don't have written a tradition, and um, I think this is a very useful way of um, communicating and sharing um, our um, ideals or our um, scenarios and things like that. So, so um, I do see there are uh, different ways of um, looking at things and different views and different vision. So we just need to be more careful about looking at those things. And I, I think when, when we're talking about um, half of the world wanting to be yeah, protected or something like that. But I think we need to be more localized um, because different ethnic group has, um, like what Sam was saying, uh, a lot of the different ethnic groups have sacred sites and that's one of the ways to be able to be successful in uh, conserving biodiversity because when people are still practicing and, and have their local religion, I think that's a good way to, to go forward. And in some of the communities with whom I work, uh, this local traditional knowledge and local traditions has been adopted by the local government to put into regulation. And it becomes, yeah, uh, so if you were interested in um, policy and governance, that's a good way to, to go forward by looking at these different traditional knowledge that are still practiced. Because um, as they said, again, uh, when they change religion or they become more global citizen, the value will change. So I think we need to take into account all these different traditional knowledge and then whether if um, some of these things are more useful than others or not, things like that. So. Yeah. <coughs> I think one of the difficulties with things like, like the GLF or these models, I just recently had a, a forum in Montreal 
it was they, they built it the first biocultural North no, first North American biocultural dialogue. Now I'm not really sure if it's it's really is in fact technically the first. <clears throat> it was a, it was supported by all the appropriate uh, alphabet soup of the UN level kind of agencies and things like that. Um, but these are all premised about perpetuating a, a horrendous global economic system. And that's the real problem. We're trying to create band-aids on top of uh, cancerous infection. Well, that's a bad me in <coughs> me mixed metaphor, of what I should say. But it's, it's rather like taking a, a, an infected wound and slapping a band-aid over the top of it and just saying, wish well, you're going to get better, and providing no antibiotics, providing no, not cleaning the wound or anything like that. It's really great. So these top level things, because it's all about perpetuating the continued extraction of profit, those models will inevitably lead to collapse and crisis. And that's the real problem <coughs> we have, uh, that what's driving, what's undermining these things is the profit motive across the way. Resource management techniques are about engineered inefficiency. If you take fisheries, which I both grew up in and studied in terms of resource management, it's about when the nets got too deep, you restrict how deep the nets are. The nets are catching too small fish, you make the mesh size of the nets bigger. If you think the boats are, are too strong, you'd limit how many kilowatt hours per, the train can be. It's all about engineering inefficiency to reduce the kind of level of harvest, which then the people who are engaged in the capturing try to figure out how to ways to circumvent that. And there's all kinds of delightful examples of how that works. And what's driving it all is the notion of an idea of an insatiable economy that has to always grow. There's even some old style capitalists who talk about, like Schumpter, 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 Schumer. I always get his name wrong. Uh, Small is Beautiful, the author from the 1960s old book. Some people have discredited his economics, whatever. But his idea was you don't need to constantly grow. And that's really what's driving the problem here. So we need to get rid of that kind of model uh, and actually build from the ground up. And I just say that. I, for the first time, I've done this little exercise in one of my classes, which was on looking at globalization practices this past term. I always ask the students at the end of the course as their final piece to write an essay on a utopian solution for all the world's problems. Big question. Do whatever you want. And I want them to explain how we got to that place. You know, they're, they're sitting somewhere out in the future. They reflect back. You know, they're in that, you know, it's, it's 2155, and they're looking at the thing. This time, for the first time ever, every single essay began with a cataclysmic environmental crisis that drove us back to the, the ubiquitous stone age, and then people moved forward. And you know, that's a kind of depressing thought, that none, no one in that class when they were constructing could envision a purposeful human intervention to make change. They felt, figured it was too late. And so I think we need to actually think about making real physical, material changes. And a lot of us in countries like Canada, the United States, Western Europe, just aren't going to like the impact. Because it reminds me about in the 1980s when Norman Dale and Frank Cassidy wrote a book called After Native Claims, talking about indigenous rights and title. And they basically said, there will be no new allocations, only reallocations of fisheries, forestry, and water, etc. And that's how our world is going to work. It's going to be reallocations. And so to deal with that 30% loss of calories that I then mentioned means that we need to lose weight up here, literally and figuratively. I'm going to stop there. No, that's, <laughs> that's great. Actually, David Attenborough was quoted recently as saying that uh, those advocating uh, perpetual economic growth, they're either madmen or they're economists. <laughs> now, that's not a slight to any economist in the room or those watching online, but uh, that's a direct quote. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's a valid point, and I think that, that some of the points that were made yesterday in, in the Q&A that I was involved in, we're talking about economic growth, but it also linked to the political system. You know, we're talking about long-term environmental hit cycles with short-term political cycles. We'll touch on that, I think, towards the end, so then we don't get in too much trouble. But. Um, the thing I also want to touch on, uh, Naveen, is um, this issue of smallholder farmers. Um, I do a lot of work on the interface between forestry and agriculture. Um, and as we know, smallholder farmers produce a significant percentage proportion of the world's food in diverse, so relatively resilient systems. Um, yet they're severely under-supported. Extension services are underfunded. Um, majority of subsidies go to uh, commercial farmers in 
places like Saskatchewan and Europe. How can we manage landscapes for better sustainability for their food systems, but also understand the role of those smallholder farmers in conserving land races um, of, of agricultural crops, uh, but also the wider biodiversity. And I think the estimate is 70% of the world's biodiversity occurs outside of protected areas in these multifunctional landscapes. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Um, um, this is something I've only just recently been starting to think about. Um, I have a PhD student and a, and a, a larger project that's been looking at uh, the role of smallholders in, um, in sustainability broadly. Um, and a few of the things we've been uh, uh, uncovering from that uh, analysis is uh, first that smallholders, um, first of all, there are 800 million of them, um, and they are some of the world's most poor people. So, you know, if you're talking about, uh, it, and also some of the most malnourished. So, if you're talking about, uh, um, you know, fighting poverty and um, addressing um, malnourishment in, uh, or undernourishment even in different parts of the world, we have to target smallholders. It's an irony that people, who, uh, 800 million people who uh, rely on farming to produce the world's uh, food are also the most malnourished. Um, so, um, so some of the things we have been discovering is that the, the agricultural economics literature for all, over a century has been fascinated with this question that smallholders are more productive than large holders and, um, and trying to explain why. Um, but we've just done some studies where we've collected a whole bunch of data from around the world and that seems to be largely true that smallholders, uh, small farms are more productive than larger farms. Um, we are also finding that uh, small farms are more agro-biodiverse than larger farms. They're much, much more crop diversity than larger farms in the same, within the same landscape. Uh, we are also finding that small farms support more um, uh, non-crop biodiversity than larger farms, probably because they have more edges. They happen to be in landscapes with, with, with a much more mixed. Um, we are finding that uh, small farms are mo actually more profit profitable per hectare as well compared to larger farms. Um, on the other hand, small farms are not, don't seem, um, smaller farmers, if you have only one or two hectares, you can't make a living from such a small area of land. A lot of them rely on off-farm income. Um, and so we're, when we look at profitably, profitability per household, you find that small farmers are not as profitable per household compared to a larger farm. So herein lies the tragedy. Um, small farms, I think, can contribute a lot to a uh, whole bunch of uh, you know ecosystem services, broadly speaking, that we care about, uh, but uh, they just can be viable in terms of their own life. Um, and as Terry said, uh, you know, a lot of the support has not gone to them. Uh, there is, uh, um, I think, the the United Nations FAO is now made, uh, targeting smallholders as uh, one of their um, key targets. The UN SDGs target smallholders. Um, how do we change things around so that we can address? Um, both the kinds of landscapes and uh, benefits that smallholders bring, but also the, the livelihoods of those people themselves. And just to follow up on that, what about changing demographies? And I'll um, address this uh, in, in the context of the youth issue as well, as Sam, in the next question. Obviously, the, the average age of farmers in North America, Europe, is getting older. But this is even more pronounced in the tropics. Um, you know, a poor rice farmer in West Java will send his or her kids to, to school. They don't want to come back and, and plant rice when they've got a, a degree in engineering or, or uh, whatever. So uh, the demographies of the, the global farming system are changing very, very quickly, very rapidly. And uh, Intu touched on this a little. How do we address that? And what will happen to these smallholder farms? Are they going to be sort of collective, collectivized in many ways uh, by conglomerates and the, the Monsantos of the world? Or is there a way to maintain that diversity of farming system? Yeah, this is, uh, I always think about this as a dichotomy between the world as it is and the world as it could be. Mm -hmm. And uh, the world as it is is that uh, you know, nobody aspires to be a farmer. Um, th there are a few who do, but largely speaking, People want a living that uh, pays well and is much more, <coughs> farming is not, not an a easy job. Um, so why would you aspire to be a farmer if it doesn't pay very well and it's, <coughs> there's a lot of drudgery involved? Um, so I see that aspiration as being um, you know, very legitimate. Um, many people I know, including myself, grew up in farming landscapes. Uh, our grandparents were farmers and then we rejected that for a life in the city and education. And, so can be hypocritical and say we want uh, you know, people to remain as smallholders. On the other hand, 
why, why isn't farming more lucrative? Um, I mean, it's, uh, food is a valuable human uh, need. Why are we paying more for food, uh, especially in the de developed world? We pay a very small share of our uh, income on food. Um, and uh, you know, if you go to a grocery store and something is 10 cents more expensive, we refuse to buy it. Um, we, just because we think it's more expensive. At the same time, as Charles said, we'll go and buy a cell phone for $800 and pay $60 a month or more. Uh, so, our, I mean, we don't make rational choices uh, clearly, and uh, especially when it comes to things like food, we certainly don't seem to be more willing to pay for um, you know, really valuable benefits that it brings. Can I add to that? Yes, there, because in, in Indonesia, for example, in, in Bali, uh, when people are already on a certain level of their livelihoods, then it becomes a choice, isn't it? And, and they are revival, sort of uh, people wanting to be more going back to the, not really became, being a farmer, but going to more um, healthier food. So people who have more income and things like that, now they are living in a more, uh, they have more land and things like that. And like myself, for example, we do have rice fields, for example, in in Bali, and then we have more crops. We have mixed crops and all those things. And I see that in British Columbia, a few weeks ago, we went with our students, and I see several of the families who become a bit more, um, what do you say, have a, a bigger income. Then you do have your children who are more diversified, isn't it? You have one <coughs> child who, who then, then will take over the farms, and then some others will be working somewhere else. And in Indonesia, it's the same. In Bali, you would have one son, for example, who take over the farms, and then another one will be working in a cruise ship, for example, and sending remittances. And, and I guess that becomes part of the adaptation uh, of how do you um, have more diversity of incomes in the families. So um, I guess that's one of the interesting part of um, one of my PhD students who was, who was studying climate change adaptation you know, for his PhD. And, and he said, um, yeah, some of the children then stay on uh, and work in the farm, but with a more new technologies and better mixed crops and all those things. And then the others will be working somewhere else and send remittances. So. Can I just make a quick Of course. <coughs> be because uh, especially when you look at North America, and, and there's, I'm not as familiar with the European ta uh, tax and, and benefit subsidy systems. Uh, a health researcher looking into the prevalence of diabetes in, in North America was look, found a very interesting correlational fact that somehow around the early 1970s you start seeing a per capita weight gain and increase in, in diabetes related things sort of spiraling out. And he did, did this kind of search and looked around and also he found there was a change in taxation from subsidizing farmers to take land out of production in North America to subsidizing their overproduction and purchasing that. So encouraging higher and higher production but higher and higher production of Basically, foods that lead, they contribute to our waste stream, which then gets fed back to us. And there's no other way to, refer, to think of the corn production stream. So anthropologists often talk about the kind of food cultures, you know, the people, the salmon, the people, the acorn, the people. Well, North Americans are people of the feed corn. You look, read every food package. Corn starch, corn starch, corn starch, corn sugar of some sort or other. And it's embedded within everything because when you have so much excess production being produced, it goes forward and it's subsidized because we're not paying the full costs of that. Society isn't paying for it and the companies are being, being charged. So a lot of the health related expenses that come from, from those kind of, the sort of what they call the metabolic um, syndrome, I think is the term they use, mm -hmm. the, these, uh, these issues. It's all part of this kind of food chain system that's going. If you remove that taxation move, which, would, which fund, really only supports cor large scale corporate farmers, doesn't support small scale farms, that one change could have an amazing impact in North America and also deal with some of the demands for have bringing land out of cultivation and creating greater parkland and more biodiversity because it actually reduces the chain. And don't let me going on all those incarcerated cattle that are sitting around. Uh, that's a whole other issue which I'll leave alone. I think we need another <laughs> session on uh, how <laughs> I, I, I on yeah. the issue of youth and agriculture. Please, go ahead. Uh, I would say one of the ways young people can play key roles is in the area of innovation and technology. And I would say young people around the world are really emerging and they are doing um, very interesting and amazing um, research as well as working on the ground in these areas. Uh, for instance, in Nigeria, there's um, a young man called Samson Bole who's been doing a lot in terms of soilless farming. And it's 
uh, received a lot of uh, media attention so far in the past um, years. And these are some of the ways where we don't need really need soil to, to plant. And without having soil, you kind of maximize space. And through that, we still have uh, actual production going on. And uh, it's not just about the issue of even planting. There's a lot of um, gaps within the agricultural um, cycle. In terms, for instance, in most developing countries, the issue of storage. A lot of produce gets wasted, uh, even right from the farm before they get to the market. So if um, young people or development agencies or the government can step in in terms of ensuring that we have like storage facilities to prevent wastage. I, I don't know the percentage, the statistics in terms of um, uh, wood, uh, the food produced from farm that gets <coughs> wasted before it can get into market or even to the table. Uh, so I think those are some of the things we need to look at, not necessarily about saying we need to expand uh, farmlands. Um, so we need to support um, the small older farmers. And um, so young people who are probably children of the small older farmers can begin to look at how technology can really play key roles. Um, you know, green financing, um, blockchain, young people are doing a lot to ensure that um, young um, small older farmers even get access to funding. So a lot um, young people are doing a lot and I think they need to be supported. No, that's a great point. I've seen a lot of work on, in Nigeria, and particularly on urban agriculture, um, and that's mainly led by, by youth groups, as far as I can, I can see. And that's something that's also taken, taken root, literally and figuratively, in Singapore and Hong Kong, areas that obviously don't have huge green spaces, but people are um, using rooftops and, and other um, areas for urban agriculture, which is you know, a, a changing paradigm in how we think about food production and the farm-to-fork um, concept as well. So that's a great intervention, thank you. At this point, it would be nice to open it up to questions from the audience. If people want to make interventions, statements, uh, ask specific, specific questions of uh, the panelists, uh, this is the time to do so. We have quite a few people online also watching who are sending in questions. But let's um, open up to the audience first. So anybody who would like to make an intervention, please. James, could you hand over the mic? Sorry, we need to use the mics just so that you, you'll be heard on, online. Um, so I oh, sorry, can you just introduce yourself? If you don't of course, mind. yes. My name is Emily. I am a master's student in the Faculty of Forestry. Um, and I was a bit late, I apologize. But I did watch the video before I arrived. And two things struck me. One is that um, I saw a very similar situation as I have seen in my own community where I've lived for the last 10 years on Vancouver Island. And um, of course, there's a challenge of bringing all these people together with divergent interests. But what I felt like was not addressed was the imbalance in power between these different interests. And that, in fact, Danon Aqua Water Company does not have an equal claim to the interests that are, were discussed in this video. And in fact, there are people whose rights are, I would say, um, hold a much greater claim than the stake that this company holds. So I was wondering if, if folks could speak to that. And just on the last question about young people, I still think of myself as a young person, even though I'm in my mid-30s now. Um, I think the youth um, <laughs> was, uh, was identified yesterday or defined as anybody between 16 and 35. So I think you're fine. OK, I'm just on the edge. I'm just on the edge. Me too. Um, <laughs> I'd like to add that I do think it's really important for us as young people to also listen to our elders. Um, you know, we've lost a lot of memory about what used to be, and that's a really important part of thinking about the future. But I would very much appreciate folks speaking to, um, you know, the differences in power and rights amongst stakeholders and rights holders in these uh, complex processes. Thank you. Just before the panel answers, let me just explain the Danone example. For some reason, um, during the, the editing of the film, they didn't explain that Danone actually pay a significant uh, compensation to local communities for access to the, to the water through a Payments for Environmental Services scheme. So I'm not quite sure why it didn't make the final cut, but there is a symbiosis, there is a, um, a relationship between the company and the communities, a financial relationship. So I don't know who would like to address that on the... Mm, well, I could say something probably. Sure. In Indonesia nowadays, there are quite a lot of big companies like Danone and um, Nestle, and um, even a lot of um, uh, what do you say, 
a lot of multinational companies coming to Indonesia. And um, it's true that probably in the past it was really, there's a big gap for uh, our relationship. But I guess uh, in a lot of communities there's always, um, um, how do you say, differences in, in um, power as well, even in the local communities or where I am from or in the different communities with whom I work, there's always the elites as well. Uh, but I guess it is getting better because now people have the possibility to do demonstrations, they have a lot of different NGOs in Indonesia who sort of uh, accompany them and all those things. And I guess a lot of these big companies now want to get better reputation because otherwise their products won't be bought by uh, all these different um, companies and things. And, and I do think uh, in Indonesia especially we do have a lot of um, organizations like Greenpeace, WWF, WCSC, there's hundreds of them uh, working and helping communities and even um, uh, human rights uh, organizations and all those things. So it is getting better. Probably not the best one that you probably think, but it depends again on where we are uh, every time. And, and I think the main thing is to have good governance. Uh, that's one of the, our challenge in Indonesia, but we are getting better. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of uh, smallholders who are able to negotiate better. Uh, especially, uh, uh, I know that, for example, Nestle or a lot of different cacao companies, they, they work a lot with communities and getting better um, technologies for them to get better crops and all those things. Um, I think in Indonesia, some of the things that are quite successful are the plasma system, which is actually you have a big company and then they buy from smallholders. Um, whether if it's cacao or um, oil palm or a lot of different things because in Indonesia we have a lot of uh, different um, products we could say from all these different uh, rainforest area and it is a, a society's choice isn't it a societal choice whether if uh, are we going to have more <laughs> national parks or whether if we want to have more uh, roads or all those different things and I guess all these things are um, needs to be negotiated and when people are more educated and um, they will be able to, to, yeah, to have more, more um, uh, negotiation on the table. So uh, one of the main things I think in Indonesia that has been going uh, quite well but probably more slowly are this negotiation because we have uh, Musyawarah Mufakat which is by consensus. Um, it's uh, in Indonesia. It's never majority who wins. Uh, democracy in Indonesia is not like in North America, really. and, and and I guess that's how it is in Indonesia. We are more than 800 different ethnic groups. We have so many different languages, but uh, yeah, we have to have a consensus, and and I think that's one of the way to go forward, probably for in the case of Indonesia. Anybody else would like to add to that? <coughs> Okay, um, it, it, it's an interesting question because I actually don't think that the po actual power differentials are actually really dealt with effectively in general. Um, because a lot of these kind of discussions are premised upon everyone in a sense coming to the table equally. But there's a big difference between where people are located, the nature of a particular state. I mean, we merely have to look to this, wi this winter to see <clears throat> armed paramilitary forces occupying and evicting indigenous land rights holders. And, and of course, when it eventually worked its way through the courts, all the charges were dropped because they actually weren't legally ex evicted. <clears throat> so, and I don't know if people don't know, that's Uniston, uh, Unisota up in the, um, the Hazeltons area where I'm referring to. So that's in Canada, uh, an ostensibly democratic country, where the federal government at times does actually engage in nation-to-nation -nation negotiations with First Nations because, of course, in British Columbia, the actual legal rights and title holders are indigenous nations. And the Canadian law dictates negotiations and uh, attempt to mitigate impact. Now, it's all stacked into, as we saw, when police forces invade with, 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 with battle gear into First Nations communities that clearly if the Crown wishes to exert its power, it's always there. So a lot of these kind of discussions that occur in this kind of idea, everyone's coming to the table, we're all moving toward yes, lurking in the background very often is an armed 
police force that will enforce one decision if it doesn't go in the right way. So I'm often very skeptical, even when communities enter into what they say is a consensus-based agreement, whether it is actually an authentic, legitimate kind of consensus, because people often make a decisions based upon, is it really worth pushing this envelope? Uh, and I certainly not around a lot of the liquid natural gas discussions and the impact benefit agreements that our First Nations community signed up down the coast. It really was, if we don't sign, we won't get anything, and it will be wrecked anyway. So that isn't really a kind of free informed prior consent. It's like a kind of triaging the opportunities because nobody actually takes into control the issue of power. It's, it's sort of implied by saying we're all equal, let's get the yes and all this kind of stuff. And it's, you know. So I'm cynical on these ideas and models because I think lurking is always this, this big police force with machine guns sitting in the background. And we see it too often in Canada. I mean, from Oka to Gustafson Lake to the more recent <coughs> events in, in, in the, up in northern BC. Before I pass back to the audience, is anybody, do, Sam, Naveen, do you want to say anything to that? Um. I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, everything that's been said on issues of power. Um, I, it's not my area of research, but I wanted to mention two things following up with, uh, from what you said. Uh, one is that uh, um, the, the political economy of, uh, um, of, of, uh, the, of the agricultural system is uh, um, similar to what you said, Charles. You talked about the corn lobby. Uh, some of the most uh, um, you know, supported crops in the U.S. happen to be sugar and cotton. Um, you know, why? Are they providing the services that we need? Um, in fact, they are doing the opposite in some sugar, especially. Um, so, and that's because there's a lobby for it, a very, very strong lobby for it. So it really comes back to the political economy. The other thing we have realized um, that's happened recently is that uh, the um, Sam talked about technologies for reducing food waste. I mean, I think that there is enormous potential for new technologies that can help, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not where the focus is. Um, the the uh, in agriculture. The amount of funding that goes into um, research um, is now dominated by the private sector. Public sector funding has fallen. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of the research, the actual research that's happening is uh, focused on private sector profits. Um, it's not focused on public goods research. Um, so nobody is focused on the public goods. Um, it's, that's a tragedy. So again, yeah, technology can have profits, but the technologies that we are focusing on right now are not the ones that can actually Thank you. Um, Jeff, you had a, a question or an intervention. Yeah, it wasn't really a question. I, I'm fascinated by all these interventions that we've had. I thought they were really interesting. I, I guess I have a concern, which is that I, I guess we in this room and in the Global Landscape Forum and in meetings about half the Earth, we are a tiny elite, you know, one percent of the world's population that has the leisure of spending our time discussing what would be good for the other 99% of the world's population. And I think we're making a mistake in, you know, there's a danger that this is all somewhat irrelevant. Um, so several people mentioned the number of smallholders and the number of rural dwellers. There's actually an awful lot of people out there in the world who may not be below the official World Bank poverty line, but they're much less well off than we are. They don't score well on the top nine sustainable development goals, they're really struggling. And I think it's their future that we should be focusing on. What we say and what we advocate should be something that's going to lead to better livelihoods for them. And I'm not sure what the landscape approach has to offer to those, I think, three or four billion people out there who are really in difficulties. So I sort of have been a big enthusiast for a landscape approach. I like all these ideas about local self-sufficiency and moving away from globalized models and moving away from the domination by big companies. But what I observe is that we in the rich elite, we actually don't uh, practice what we preach. We actually do vote for governments that, that maximize economic growth, that support big companies and high tech and centralized decision making and everything else. So could the, the landscape movement be the beginning of a turning point where we actually start to reverse this trend towards a, a totally growth dominated model? It would be nice to think that it would be, but I'm not convinced of that. Um, and if it is just a, 
a peripheral discourse that's going on about some sort of ideological future we'd all love to see, then you know what's going to change the, the model that the world is moving on? Because in democratic countries, we persist in voting for people that do all the things that we claim we don't like. But we still vote for them. And if they don't deliver 5% or 3% economic growth, we kick them out and get somebody else in who does. So there seems to be a huge gap between the ideology of this landscape thing that we've, this can of worms we've opened, and the reality of the world in which we live and in which we debate it. And that, that bothers me a lot. Well, I'm very pleased to say I've never voted for one of those folks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but you know, there's a lot. I just say one, one of our chief counsels in Kakao one time commented that 80 to 90 percent of the people in the community live third, what he called third world standards. And so we don't even have to go outside of British Columbia to find this issue where people are engaged in a multiplicity of ec at livelihood practices in order to stay afloat, to exist. Where sometimes the poorest in our community have no access to our foods, and you, it's the next stage up to have access. Uh, and a lot of times the practice that we engage in are criminalized in order to survive. So to go out and catch fish and to give it, to, well, give it, ah, let me rephrase that. To sell it to you, I'd be committing a criminal offense. But in, if it's going to, and so what it means is that because we've actually criminalized Aboriginal rights and title, in order to make a livelihood, I have to sell my fish at a discounted rate because, so that you get a deal and you will be quiet about buying it from me and I can feed my family and provide more resources and not have to be stuck on social assistance which keeps me in a, in a backward cycle. And so some very, locally at any rate, some very simple things could occur whereas the Crown re relinquishes its false claims for control over these resources and this returns to the rightful title holders. And then we start building from that. And because the first, because that really provides a, a different kind of thing. And I think that's where, where it goes. And I would actually kind of agree with some of your sense, because oftentimes these forums are always focusing on somewhere away. Literally, way over an ocean, across a mountain, where the real problem is the downtown on east side of Vancouver and how it's been created as a zone of containment. How the way in which indigenous people are evicted from our own lands because it's criminal behavior and it forces people out into different types of, uh, of service providers. How we then actually create certain types of laws on people's entry into this country that can inhibit their abilities to act so they have to move into undocumented forms of economic practices which further re reinforces. And how we do elect, I mean I don't know how people always consistently vote against their own best, best interests. That is such a puzzle to me. Uh, and I, you know, it always, except maybe the re, it's like the consensus thing, the recognition. If you're going to actually, if we're not, it doesn't look like the future of capitalism is going to shift, maybe it's better to vote for the most obnoxious, most out, outlandish, <coughs> most sort of pro capitalist bum in the lot, because it just, you know, might as well. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's the best I can come to, and that's not an informed academic opinion. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's fine. Um, actually, one of the questions that came in online uh, was about economic injustice and how we address that. Um, and I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the session that the, the goal of the Global Landscapes Forum is to influence a billion people in more equitable, sustainable land use and systems. Uh, I think it's a rather lofty goal. Um, and we're sat in rooms like this and we may be going crazy on Twitter and there are how, how many thousands of people watching around the world. But I, I guess, Jeff, let me, let me throw it back to you. What, what would you think? Uh, you've been part of this um, movement for so many years. You've been involved in conservation, involved in sustainable development. Um, you've been involved at the very highest levels um, of negotiation with World Bank, etc., the CGIR. Where do you see change being levered? I think the simple answer to your question is that I find it more and more difficult to come down on either side of any of these things because I see they're so complex and there are so many interlinked things going on that, that trouble me that I, I can't clearly say that certain ways forward are going to solve all the problems and others are not. Yeah. But you do have to recognize that, that you know, Davos man globalization, everything else, has been the thing that's driven people below these mm -hmm. artificial poverty lines. It has led to people having better education, food, healthcare, and a whole bunch of things. And the sort of 
UN type SDG planning has not really achieved very much in that direction. It's represented in ideology. So maybe it's a sort of yin and yang thing and you need both of them. So to sort of respond a bit to Michael's points, I, I think that there's a real danger in assuming that the very large number of people that are going to inhabit the earth at least for the next hundred years or so are going to do very well if we back away from technology and, and economies of scale and, and big, big industries. You know, that we, because we haven't got an alternative to that, unfortunately. It's not just going to be more highly effective smallholders. That, you know, I'm sure you agree with that. That's, they may produce a lot of food and they may do all those other good things you mentioned, but it looks like they're a fading star in, in terms of the world's ability to... They don't get food. They, they get food. They don't get health care and education and all the other things that we would like to see people get. So I, I guess when I see the sort of companies that Intu mentioned doing things sort of landscape scale and trying to work at that level, I think that's, that's very encouraging. So whether there's some sort of middle ground where we can capture the benefits of technology and globalization in a more controlled way, a sort of Danish form of democracy with a lot more decision making and control and integration occurring at local levels, I think that's an interesting thing to pursue. I guess the institutions, you know, all the institutions that humanity has created are throughout our history have been to do with allocating resources and access to resources and control over resources. Whether we can really reinvent them to some sort of more localized thing, that's an interesting question to investigate. So we sort of are trying to superimpose this landscape stuff on all the existing institutions. Yeah. But are we moving towards a point where we might want to substitute some more localized control? These will be very, very radical departures from the way the world is moving at the present moment. That's, that's the problem. And it's hard for me to see how, how that turning point can come. There's so much inertia in the system that we're in at the moment. Um, so it's, I don't have a strong opinion. <laughs> I shall observe with great interest as long as I possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Please. And please just introduce yourself if you don't mind. Hello, I'm Agnia. I'm a fourth year student in biology. And um, I am from Ukraine. And there's a lot of deforestation happening. And there's also um, a state of um, no laws. <coughs> or, it's not, there's laws, but there's no governments in force. Or like there's lots of illegal activity. There's a lot of export towards European Union because Ukraine doesn't have like the consequences for people and I really wonder like there's in similar things are happening in Brazil right now and I wonder how what are your advices to like change the mentalities of people that don't have fears about those things and like who'd like to tackle that and, uh, in in our case, um, I guess um, for me, uh, when um, I go to the field with uh, the students, we always try to talk to different groups of people, like schools or the elders or the youth um, clubs or things like that in the different places where we go. Basically, awareness is a very important <coughs> thing, isn't it? Because um, a lot of the case in Indonesia is we have so many um, different animals like orangutan, tigers, elephants that are sort of very charismatic species for big international organizations to save. But the local communities are very poor in those areas. And so we do need to make them sort of a bit more proud, we could say, about their own areas and the richness that they have. Because it's not like that they don't realize it, but they have other priorities, isn't it? So maybe in the case of Ukraine, um, the people probably have other priorities because they are still at a level where they don't have regular income or they don't have a, uh, a level of uh, life that is sort of aspired like everybody else in the world probably. And it's the same as in Indonesia. We have communities who are still 
very, very poor. And in the Congo Basin, where I work with the Baka Pygmies, they live in a little hut. So, yeah, they have other priorities. They have to survive first. They, their children are dying uh, under five years old, you know, those things. So I guess awareness and educated girls, I think that's very important. Uh, once you have uh, young women who are more educated, then they won't have 10 children instead of, yeah, having 10 children, they would have just two children or things like that. And then they would have a better vision of um, life, for example. But again, when I said education, it doesn't mean just proper or, how do you say, um, schooling system, like in the Western way of thinking, because it's also a choice. In Indonesia, there are communities who have um, a traditional way of learning um, that they want to keep, for example. And how do you link that with your wise practices and all those things. I think that's part of the education. <coughs> and in Indonesia, our curriculum and things like nowadays, it's completely changing and all those things. I think that's also, we need to look into our curriculum and all those things. And a lot of the, of the, of the things that we do with organizations like WWF or CI, Conservation International, is also, for example, making uh, little books or things like that about local biodiversity or things like that. And, and we give it to the local kids and using drawings again. Um, if people are interested, I have this little <coughs> book about visualizing sustainable landscape and it's available online on the IUCN website. Um, it's basically how do you look at this landscape uh, by using simple methods, using drawings and using videos or using little um, paintings and all those things and other visual things that are easy for people to understand, and then so you can discuss things or negotiate things. Because the goal when we go to the field is not just the final product, but it's more how do you get to discuss things together? How do you debate things? And how do you think about the trade-offs? Because trade-offs, I think, is it's um, very important. Again, as Jeff said, there's no black and white. There's so many gray areas in everything. And how, do you, how much do you want to lose to get something? Uh, in return, isn't it? So I think the balance needs to be right, and every landscape is different, isn't it? So how do you negotiate this in different landscape? That's I think that's the important thing. Can I? Yes, Naveen, please go ahead. Um, I mean, the way I look at it is uh, that we need to look at different sides of the spectrum. On the one hand, there are people uh, doing illegal mining or deforestation uh, because that's the only way they can earn their livelihoods or hunting or whatever. On the other hand, there are people who are doing it because of greed, as Charles said, and uh, you know we need to look at both of the both sides of that. Um, I think inequality is one of the biggest, um, I would say, crises we have on this planet. Um, we focus a lot on the one billion people who are malnourished, or two billion people who are, um, you know, uh, uh, poor or without water. But there are a small segment of the population that's extremely rich, and we don't. Know very, we know very little about what they are up to, um, and they are in some of us. Some of them are in this room, right? Uh, but uh, Oxfam had a report that said that the world's eight richest people, eight people, own half of the world's wealth. I mean, that's. Uh, there's been many complaints about that report because wealth is very hard to measure. You know, if somebody has stock options, you know, until they sell it, it's not anyway. But whatever it is, um, you know, even if it's 10% of the world's wealth, I mean, that's still ridiculous that eight people can have that. Um, and often they don't pay taxes. Um, there was a report in the New York Times just 10 days ago that Amazon hasn't paid taxes. So, I mean, that, I think that's criminal. And so while we focus on the world's poor, we also need to focus sometimes on the world's rich. I also wanted to talk about um, uh, the current um, roles that young people are playing in terms of holding government and private sector accountable through, the, let's say, for instance, the climate strike, which has now gained momentum all over the world, you know, in Vancouver, in Canada, uh, Uganda, across the globe, young people, high school kids, university students going on strike to hold the government accountable to take action because oftentimes we come to these kind of gatherings, conferences, we have conventions, we have uh, policies that we talk about and we would want to implement. But at the end, most of those targets are not being met. And you know, young people kind of go into parliament, go into private sector, um, changing the, their lifestyle in terms of buying sustainable products. You know, those are some of the ways that young people are, are making their own mark in terms of 
uh, contributing to the climate um, change discourse and um, adaptation and mitigation. So in especially countries where it's democratic, I know there are places where people can demonstrate, but in places where such are kind of um, legal, people are kind of gathering momentum and uh, placing um, a lot of pressure on government and private sector to make uh, these critical changes that needs to be made. <clears throat> I want to pick up one, uh, on one thing that Naveen mentioned about the two spectrums about this notion of legality. But also, I, mean, I, I know nothing about the particulars in the Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine and how that might, might go. But if you look at the question of deforest, deforestation, which uh, there's a sense to me that, that suspects, because I know a little bit about the fisheries extraction that's occurred in the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is the part of the former Soviet Union where there's this massive ripping out of resources, funded mostly by Japanese and American companies, by the way. We're actually funding all this resource extraction, and they're taking, they're leaving the carcasses of the fish behind. They're just going after the rope and for the market. And this is really this major thing. And that's a kind of a transnational form of disruption and not paying attention to local resources. Bishop, British Columbia, one could arguably say, is in a lawless state today. Uh, people in this room, probably the majority, would probably disagree with my sentiment for saying that, would point to all kinds of issues of law and precedent and the rightful place of the parliament and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> but if you take a look at it, clearly there was an, a, a, a period of incipient <coughs> warfare that lasted from about the 1780s well into the 1860s with little up breaks here and there where there's this kind of control of, of control and manifest where the resources that were extracted from this problem were, province were done illegally. And the point of my argument that I'm making is that capitalism operates in fully in a kind of illegal basis, which is one of the reasons, and here's another unpopular notion, I'm not all that bent out of shape about the so-called money laundering. That's just undocumented fiscal transactions, which is actually extending from the basic structure of capitalist productions in general. So we've had this opportunity, and when did it really start to taper down in terms of the, the theft in the, in the forest lands in British Columbia? It really wasn't until so much had moved that the profitability of the forest sector started to shift and change in the 70s, early 80s, retooling uh, mills, and then realizing, well, why do we even bother cutting our timber? Let's just offshore it someplace, get a higher premium for it, reduce our labor force structures in the, in the woodland, and then a growing environmental movement started to target particular zones to preserve for old growth timber and it became a kind of public policy issue and of course where do the companies go? They find First Nations to form joint ventures with them, say here's this great look we're doing it the indigenous way because we have an indigenous CEO who's jumped into our company to move it forward. It's still theft. Yet the focus is on the theft of our community members who are going out catching, picking abalone, harvesting salmon, getting halibut, crabs, selling them to stay alive. And that's what our the state focuses on, illegal behavior. And so I think part of the discussion, and as I said, I don't know the specifics there, and it's, it's quite different, I suspect, from some of the principles. But this issue of illegality is I actually think the fundamental process of extracting resources without paying attention to primary resource title holders and rights holders is illegal, illegal and theft, but it's justified by those just because the Kamsiwa, the kind of colonizing people, have the political might and the material power to claim that their way is the right way. And then they want to transform the local into these great big pretty global pictures of you flowing around because basically they want to separate you from your base, your roots. So you, like the commodity in a container, in a mass container shipment, can move wherever the job calls you, wherever your education takes you, and move around. And it's a way, a fundamental way of disrupting, deracinating the world. And it further contributes to the alienation, which leads us, basically, uh, environmental collapse is what will provoke change, which is a very dystopic way of framing it. But sadly, I think that's, because people aren't willing to relinquish the, the privileges. We might observe, we think, we see the situation gets too complex, too difficult. There's so many mitigating factors. Yeah, because we're not willing to relinquish the power and authority that we have because we've done too well by it. It's hard. And all of us, even sitting here, know that there's elements that we would, we're going to have to be kind of sh shifted and pushed to relinquish. And that's part of the problem, because you get bought in, you get little tidbits dropped on in your basket. So we're not, no one in here, I doubt, is, sits in the actual 
<clears throat> but we've all basically get implicated in a certain way, and it makes it hard to make the change. But it's a change that we need to make if we really want to change our world. And that's my disappointment, or my hope, actually. I think it, it is both a disappointment. Okay? But there's a hope there that we can change the world before it changes us. And that's what we're running up against. That's why those young kids are out on the streets in the schools. Because there's a recognition, they're thinking, if they want a future, and rather than us sitting here saying how complicated it is because we've benefited from it for the last 50, 60, 70 years, um, I think we need to make, try to seize the change now and do something real where we're located. And how would you advocate for that change? Uh, first of all, you're beginning by an immediate recognition of the rights of title holders. <clears throat> you start from there and that you also put massive taxes on flows of capital and goods moving back and forward over regimes and disarticulate from global connections. I mean, I, I, and I know people say that's a cataclysmic event. Well, we're approaching a cataclysmic event. It means that we need to think about, and while well, individual choices, but we need to collectivize those individual choices in the sense that just because I decide I'm going to reuse everything that comes into my house, I'm going to reduce my waste chain, most of the waste that's produced in the food that I'm conserving, the autumn that I'm recycling, are in the production chain. So we need to actually try to start making, forcing things. And so individual action can lead to that, but we need to do it together. If we can't do it together, well, we might as well throw up our hands and just forget about it. Thank you. That's pretty powerful. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yes, sit the back there. Um, just, can you just wait for the microphone? And if you could just tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Ariel. I am from the Chinook Nation, and I'm an undergraduate student here in forestry. Um, I think we've talked a bit about it. We've touched on it a little bit, but um, Western conservation, like at its heart, is a very colonial, very imperial institution, and it has been since it was kind of formed, like in the United States, in the I think 1800s. But um, I was wondering. Thinking about that, if any of you have any ideas of how this very Western ideology of conservation and the way it's been instituted around the world can be transformed, can be shifted into, and like in a good way to incorporate other forms of knowledge, to incorporate, incorporate other ways of being and other ways of understanding of the world. Because I think that's like a very necessary direction for us to go to, to like actually start conserving what we have on this planet, instead of uh, doing this in this very like settler colonial way that it's kind of been instituted for the past at least 150 years. So I was wondering if any of you have any um, visions for what the future of transforming that could look like. Thank you. We did touch on that in the beginning of the session, but I mean, it's yeah. a very good question. Intu, would you like to yeah. address that? So um, in, in some communities with whom we, we work, um, in Indonesia, for example, um, they try to revive some of the um, adapts or customary laws because they see that as a very useful thing to do because of the uh, changing uh, lifestyle and changing uh, environment in the area. So I think that's one of the things that is quite a, uh, a good idea, but sometimes it's still very challenging because then, uh, yeah, basically it has to be agreed by all the different people who are in the landscape, but most of the landscape where we work, there are so many different ethnic groups in Indonesia, for example, or in the Congo Basin with the Baka and Aka pygmies, for example. Um, it's, but it is a good way forward, I think, to be able to recognize some of the useful um, traditional knowledge or traditional practices and put that into local regulation, for example, uh, or some of those wise practices. And um, it's also a way to sort of negotiate a little bit. Uh, why do you need to conserve this area, or why do you need to to, to save this species, or, and so on and so forth? And I think uh, nowadays there are a lot of different platforms that exist um, in this different um, landscape. It could be at a, uh, well, it usually starts at a village level first, and then it goes to a bigger scale district level or, or provincial level and so on and so forth. And, and there's always challenges because some of the people who are not from that area, most of the time they don't know about the regulation. And I think um, the taboo, for example, for an, for an ethnic group would be a, um, because they, they have a reason, isn't it, when there is a taboo in the first place, whether if it's, a, it's their totem or something like that, or is it um, something that you can't eat and things like that. It's, 
So I guess um, uh, in uh, Eastern Indonesia, for example, they try to revive the SASI system or the adult systems because they know, uh, for example, that if there are some areas where the fish are spawning or when, uh, when there is season where the, the wild boar are reproducing and so on and so forth. So uh, some of the communities are trying to revive this traditional uh, knowledge about all these different things. <coughs> Sam, um, your research touches on a little bit of this indigenous conservation processes in Nigeria. Do you want to yeah, respond I, I to Errol's question? Nigeria, we, there's not uh, many things going on in Nigeria as regards that. I think most uh, conservation mm -hmm. or development organizations focus more on Central Africa, mm -hmm. and probably that's why Institute is working <laughs> in the Congo Basin. Uh, probably because they have more kind of uh, forest mm -hmm. landscape and um, mm -hmm. biodiversity, I would say. Uh, but for the sacred groups, um, there's been a lot of uh, depletion because just like, you know, uh, Nigeria was colonized by the British people. And um, so they also kind of, there are a lot of uh, parks or reserve in Nigeria that even called Queen Elizabeth um, Forest Reserve because, you know, still talking about the colonial past that um, the country owns. Uh, but uh, the research has shown that in some of these sacred places, um, groups, there is more biodiversity compared to these um, national parks, so to speak. So just like Intu was saying, we need in some ways to kind of go back to these um, local practices and um, look at how we can make them more appealing to people because also uh, development, um, modernization is also affecting or impacting on people wanting to adopt or continue to practice uh, these local practices, especially when young people kind of move to the city, they have like this new knowledge and they don't want to get involved in some of those practices again. Uh, so uh, there's need for uh, young people to be encouraged and to make some of those local practices uh, kind of appealing to them uh, for those kind of uh, important landscapes to be preserved because in yeah. times to come, we might lose some of those landscapes too. I think the, the important thing as well is, is actually uh, from us coming from the scientific point of view is, for example, I talk with some of the communities in the Malukus, for example, about uh, regulating the SASI system, about harvesting uh, either fish or birds and things. And when people understand better the reproduction uh, cycle, for example, then that would be able to help. Then when can you uh, catch them or when do you have uh, to, yeah, to save the area, not to catch them or things like that or to hunt them. And, uh, for example, one other thing is uh, I was talking with some of the elders in, um, in Seram, in, in the, in the, up in the mountain, uh, Huawulu communities. They said that, uh, yeah, it's just, this is the way how we do it uh, for hundreds of years. Then uh, a biologist could come who is an ornithologist, and then they will do the study on how many months do a bird, for example, have um, <coughs> their eggs and things like that. And, how long does it take for them to be able to reproduce the first time and so on and so forth. So then it becomes more scientific and, and I think it's really interesting. This thing is very um, useful as well for the, the younger generation then to understand better the life cycle of an animal, for example, or even for a plant. Uh, for example, uh, when do you harvest it and how do you harvest it more sustainably and so on and so forth. So basically it's really understanding the sustainability of the use of these natural resources, basically, isn't it? So, yeah. Charles? Yeah, I just want to mention, one of the things that's been happening is what in some communities are calling tribal parks, but they're not actually being operated as completely preservation or, or, or conservation, but they're basically using the language of park to then regulate access, and they're based upon notions of title. Uh, and it's a big step improvement from Guayana's Park, which was a Crown Haida agreement, which is a co-management zone. And they're shifting down to you have the Nuchonoth, There's one community in the Chonoth have one. Uh, the the Chilcolton are actually putting one in place. And there's a few examples of these, which is a different model, because it's premised upon the indigenous rights holders as the basis of moving forward. Okay. Can I? Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience? Yes. Your hand went up so fast. Impressive. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Wei Ye. I'm a PhD student at Faculty of Forestry. Uh, my research topic is about livelihoods in protect areas in China. So I have um, uh, some questions. Um, 
about what should we do. Uh, I have I have a feeling when I'm doing my research, I feel that biodiversity is not a dominant area in the government department or in for the majority uh, people. So I, but I I think it's very hard to meet the like the CBD target 2020. If we want to meet those target, if it's not a dominant um, area in for most of the uh, government department, it's just very hard for us to meet it, and even. Like if we have some other uh, uh, like other targets, just just cannot meet it. And I'm wondering, what efforts should we do to make biodiversity a dominant target, not only for like the Department of Forestry or Environment Protection, but for many other related departments? And how, yeah, how how can we do that? So biodiversity is central to <coughs> policy. I only hesitate because that's such a big question. It's not that much yeah. time. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure I would advocate for it to be the dominant target. Um, I think the you know the latest IPBS report has um, suggested that biodiversity is critical to a whole bunch of other targets, and so it's in inherently valuable to focus on biodiversity that it can help achieve other targets, but I think uh, nations have different priorities. I think you talked about communities have different yeah. priorities, nations have different priorities. And exactly. If biodiversity target, I mean, one of the things I think uh, was in the video as well that uh, Terry mentioned, is there are inherently trade-offs and uh, more and more research shows that we have many more trade-offs than we have win-win situations. Um, so. There are trade-offs between biodiversity and food production. There are trade-offs between biodiversity and livelihoods. Um, they don't have to be, but that's the way it seems to be. Um, and so I think prioritizing one over the other would, could potentially be harmful. And I guess if the communities understand biodiversity, most of the communities with whom I work, biodiversity is what you can find. It's food security as well, isn't it? If you, if you have your biodiversity and then it's part of their um, food actually and then that there is a cycle that you can understand again as I said uh, the reproduction and all those things and the good governance of it and things like that then it could probably help to to advocate biodiversity <laughs> but other than that uh, yeah, it, it would be quite <coughs> difficult isn't it to yeah I mean one of the things that I've been thinking about more recently is that there, we have this sense as scientists and scholars that we can have it all um, that if only we manage the landscape, if only we talk to each other, um, you know, we can have all of our wants as well as biodiversity and everything else. And I'm not sure that's true anymore. Um, I think we have to start talking about needs. Um, and yes, there are uh, a lot of poor people in the world who have higher needs, but there are a lot of us who have much more than what we need. And unless we start thinking about our needs, I don't think we can. Can, we, can, we can't engineer our way out of this problem without thinking about overconsumption. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's so much wasted consumption. Forget about overconsumption. Just, uh, I'll just say, mm. I, I met a man who used to be the Pacific CEO for Maersk. I forget what the exact position was. And he made a comment. Of course, he told me, he said, I'll deny it if you ever tell anyone about it. But I mean, it's, it was, he spent a life shipping stuff people don't want or don't need and shouldn't want. And, that's the problem. That's the inherent problem of our, our wider global society. <coughs> Stuff we don't need and we shouldn't want it. Okay. Um, <laughs> one final question. Rumi. Please make it um, relatively short. <laughs> um, my name is Rumi Naito. I'm a PhD student at uh, Institute for Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability here. Um, so my comment, uh, well, my question is about uh, something uh, that resonates with what Intu has been talking about. But I often think about, I also often think about um, how communities are increasingly uh, heterogeneous, and then uh, that also means that we will have to think about um, different approaches and interventions to address different needs, uh, worldviews, and the values of each communities. Um, 
having said that, um, my question is how, um, how, I guess, realistic and how feasible is it for policymakers and the practitioners to think about and design um, the, the interventions that, that are tailored to different needs and values of different communities? Um, is it, is it the, the, the direction <coughs> we want to also think about when we engage with communities? Or do you think um, more like overarching system level intervention might actually, like for example, giving land in your, or, or something like at the le higher level interventions might actually facilitate necessary uh, ground for communities of different backgrounds might be able to participate. Thank you. Well, I think you need to do it different levels <laughs> because you can't just go from a government perspective and uh, it's true that the government is going to be the one taking decision probably for a specific landscape but nowadays um, there are a lot of different platforms where communities could be involved um, private sector also will be involved in all those things and I guess that's our main challenge I guess um, again as a university uh, I guess that's a, a possibility for us to influence uh, at different levels, uh, not only uh, village level or district level, but also um, in the national level. But I guess also when we, we talk with the diff all these different level of landscape, then it gives some insights for each one of them. And again, it comes back to the good governance. Uh, then a landscape needs to have this good governance first. And who's going to be uh, doing it and who's going to monitor it and who's going to to enforce the law and all those things. I think that's very <coughs> important. And you do need to have the the ownership of all these different, you could say, well, planning or whatever the development um, agenda in the area. Everybody needs to be involved because otherwise, yeah, it's going to be again, the inequality will come up at the top otherwise. So I think you do need to engage um, at several levels um, in the landscape. Okay, um, we're actually three minutes away from, from closing. And um, what I'd like to do is ask each of you to very briefly, very briefly, <laughs> give us a message of hope. We read all these reports, the IPBES report on biodiversity, a million species are going to be extinct in 20 years. The biodiversity report from FAO that says we're heading towards agricultural apocalypse. Sometimes it's hard to get up in the morning. So each of you, give us a message of hope to close. Charles, you stopped. Uh, <clears throat> well, in our community's oral history, there are moments of great cataclysm and collapse where <laughs> floods, waves, etc., come in and destroy communities. But the thing is, there have always been people who have stood up and recognized that there's a possibility to move forward and rebuild a, a new society based upon the old ways in the new ch conditions. That's, I think, the hope that lies in front of us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Sam? for me, I think the youths um, is the hope. The youths are the hope for the coming generation and the now. And uh, we are really standing up to taking responsibility through, just like I mentioned, the climate strikes and a lot of other things that young people are doing uh, globally. Uh, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration 2021 to 2030, uh, for instance, in Africa, um, the African forest landscape restoration um, 100 to uh, restore 100 million um, hectares of forest land. I, I think youth should be seen as critical partners in making sure that these um, targets are being met. I'm going to up to the task. Thank you. Naveen? Yeah, I'll follow up and I also agree with Sam that I think the youth movement has really uh, brought a lot of energy into, uh, into the idea of collective action. Um, in, you know, I think Charles has referred, referred to the idea that personal actions are not um, enough. Um, I also want to caution that we can't just lay all the responsibility on the youth. Um, we have to join them. You can't just say it's your problem. Um, so uh, we, we need to join that collective action. Um, and I, I, I will, um, maybe I'll leave it there. <laughs> and until you get the last word. <laughs> so I, I think, yeah, we now uh, have to be open-minded and understanding that there are a lot of challenges and different complexities in each landscapes. I guess learning from each other and sharing with each other, uh, then we sort of uh, think that hopefully people will take better decisions. Thank you. And I think we're out. Um, but just... 
of the studio audience, thank you for coming. But can we please thank the panelists in the usual way? <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thanks to the audiovisual team. Um, we've done a fabulous job. I don't know how many people we've live streamed to, but yesterday's events went to about 17,000 people. So um, no pressure there, guys. So thank you. Thanks, everybody.